How do we create a community where everyone belongs? This is the underlying question driving this discussion between a conservative atheist and a progressive Christian who, oh, by the way, happen to be good friends. So I think that a good topic for us to talk about would be um, the role of uh, religion and politics. Um, I know we had talked about um, discussing church and state and separation or non-separation, but I, I think that this uh, topic of whether or not religion should play a role in politics, and and I think that it would also be interesting to define some of those terms to, to figure out what we mean by some of those terms um, when we're talking about politics. Um, you know, and, and that might uh, lead into other discussions, but um, I think that it's a, uh, a decent uh, conversation to have. Before we start actually jumping into that, this might um, give us some, uh, might give us a, a springboard too. I wanted to read a little bit um, from a blog that uh, my blog is, uh, the, the fact that I just said blog dates me. Of course, now everyone knows that I'm uh, not under 26. Um, a blog that my my wife used to maintain. So this is this is back in the heady days of the, the of early social media. Really weren't using social media for um, uh, maybe some people were using social media to to promote their businesses. Um, but it was it was early days of uh, Instagram as we know it today. Um, obviously, it's not early days of Facebook, but it was a much earlier days. Roughly 2015, 2016, you'll, you'll be able to tell uh, that in a second. But she maintained a blog for a while, and um, this one came up in, in my memories, uh, my Facebook memories, and I thought that it was apropos. So I just want to read a little bit, just a little bit from it. Uh, it's titled, When Somebody You Love Has Awful Politics. And as um, just as a disclaimer, just so everyone, for context, my wife is a licensed uh, marriage and family therapist, and she has been for I think 20 years or so, it's, um, she's, she's had a practice. So um, she's been doing this for a really long time and that's the context of what she's, what she's writing this. So uh, it titles, When Someone You Love Is Awful Politics. She says, as a therapist, I've seen eyes roll, arms crossed, yelling, personal attacks, paint melting rage. I've even seen a checkbook thrown across the room. And none of this compares to what I've seen this election season. And I'll let you guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. which election, se election yeah. season she was talking about. I would normally add evidence here, but do I really need to? It's in your news feed and at your dinner table too. This isn't a post about how to save the country. That's way above my pay grade. This is a post about how to save your relationship with the people you love who are on the other side of the aisle. Because despite all the fear you have right now, this election season will pass. Time will march on, and you will find yourself across the table from them once more. Whether or not you can meet their eye depends a great deal upon what happens now uh, when it's the hardest. So as someone who sat in her fair share of hot exchanges and even volunteered professionally to enter the fray, I have a few suggestions. I'm not going to read all of this. I'm just going to read the, uh, the headlines real quick. There's four suggestions she has. I thought this was interesting. Rewind the footage. Listen first. Speak to common ground. And give up on agreeing. The only one I want to read real quick is the rewind the footage. I think this is interesting. So under rewind the footage, she says, sure, right now they're glaring. Their eyes are bulging. They've just said something unthinkable. You're flabbergasted. You're questioning who this person even is. How could they be so stupid or cruel or ignorant or naive or self-righteous or hateful? Look right into their eyes. Rewind the video. Rewind it as far back as you need to. Maybe it's a year ago, maybe it's decades. Rewind it back to the last moment with them where you felt connected. Rewind it to the last moment where you felt love from them and take a snapshot of that. Now overlay that image with the one in front of you. They are still in there somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah. I think that's a really good uh, way to jump into what I imagine is going to be a pretty similar, if not more extreme season that we're rolling into in 2024. Sure. Yeah. Um, I was, in fact, this morning I was watching um, 
YouTube videos about the election, mm -hmm. most recently the um, Republican debate mm -hmm. that um, Donald Trump was noticeably not participating in, uh -huh. um, still leading by what is 54% in polls right. over any other, uh, has 54% support. Um, and so it's very possible that we have the exact, um, well, 2016 is different than, but, um, so that was 2016? This was 2016, yeah. All right, so the 2020 was worse. Mm -hmm. And 2024, obviously, is going to be worse than that. Yep. In fact, uh, one of the one of the quotes that I just read this morning, actually heard, uh, was Trump saying that this is sort of um, I'm not going to get the exact quote right, but that this is like the do or die. 2024. Is it the election of the century? He is saying that it is. It will determine the survival. Of, I don't think he was. In t I don't think he meant the the United States, but he definitely meant the Republican Party. So for for many, I mean, think about it. Just after the last election, you heard people talking about civil war. Yep, and every single election I can remember has been. That's why I was making that joke. Has been the election, the most important election Ever. of our time. Right. Yeah. But I don't remember ever, though, hearing like people planning on what the Civil War would look like. Sure. Right? Like, I remember new, there was news about people talking about how they were prepared to shoot their neighbors. And someone else was like, well, I don't have guns, but I, I do have knives, and I'm really skilled with knives. And to hear people actually like contemplating having to go to war with their neighbor and how they would do it, that was that was a little frightening. And then, but I didn't hear any of the, um, and I know what you're saying, as far as people feeling like this is the most important presidential election. And I do like, from the post, you know, like this too, at least what I heard was sort of the idea of this too shall pass um, in what Krista had written in her blog. But this is, this is the first, like, the last couple of elections, the first time, like I said, I've heard people, like, actually contemplating how they would go about killing their neighbors because the Civil War would be breaking out neighbor to neighbor, not, you know, north and south type of thing was what I was hearing. And then also, to hear, to hear a candidate, and maybe it's just my exposure is limited. I mean, obviously, I haven't seen or heard all, all candidates of all time. But to talk about this idea that... Um, this election could determine whether or not we survive. Type of stuff. The hyperbole. I think it's hyperbole, but to some, it's not. Well, I think that that's interesting, um, and is a uh, a good thing for us to talk about, considering the the theme of this podcast. Because, um, you know, this is another thing that that my wife talks about with people a lot is uh, to recognize the role that uh, artificial intelligence through social media has had in our real life discourse. And that is that nobody is seeing the same world. Because um, I will tell you in all of my feeds, mm -hmm. I hear the same thing, quotes from Democrats. I hear all the quotes from Biden from Biden, well, not not directly from Biden, from Biden's administration, uh, and from left-leaning or from Democrat um, either representatives or uh, just talking heads, about how, yes, this election will determine the fate of democracy. Do we have a democratic, and, and that democracy hung in the balance in 2020 and that we almost lost it. We were on a knife's edge and we might have actually lost it. Maybe we did lose it mm. in 2020 and that we are, um, that we're, we're right on the edge and we better, we better make the right choice. Otherwise, everything falls off the cliff. Which goes back to the conversation we've had the last couple of days, or the last couple of weeks, which is this sense 
that I think everyone has, that we're coming closer and closer to the, the big battle, mm -hmm. the, the, the final decision. Right. And that we have to, at some point, we're going to have to make that decision, and then we'll see what happens on the other side. So my, my only point is that um, I think that it's important or it's, it's, it's a good idea for everyone who wants to maintain relationships that aren't based on ideology. Mm -hmm. So like you and I wanting to be friends, no matter what maybe politics says or religion says or whatever. We just want to be friends because we like each other and mm -hmm. maybe we want to learn something from each other. And how do you learn something unless you listen to people that have different ideas from you and whatever, but we just want to be friends, right? I think that one of the things that is uh, a really good idea to remember, for me to remember too, is that nobody is seeing the same news. Nobody is seeing the same world. Because I 100% believe you that you saw, that you have seen these clips. Right. And that they probably mirror the clips that I see just from other people. And so it's very easy. It's very easy. It seems like it would be the most easy thing to assume that um, anybody who identifies with X, they all are kind of on the same page as far as uh, as far as what they're saying, because that's all I'm seeing. Sure. Right? Right. Um, so, you know, maybe we're, we're getting kind of off of this, uh, the topic of um, church and state, you know, obviously we're kind of talking about um, how do we, uh, can you continue to have IRL relationships, um, you know, in a, in a time of intense ideological conflict? I got the thoughts. Yeah, go for it. All right. So one is when you're talking about the different um, input, right, that shapes your worldview. That's right. My, I guess that's my, that might be my words. But it reminds me of, and I shared the story several months ago, but I was in the gym, and they have on the TVs, uh, they have all those TVs. You know what I'm talking about? Yep. Like you've got all the treadmills and all the cardio glides, and you've got all those TVs. Yep. And on the TV, one channel was CNN and the other channel was Fox News. Yep. And they both were talking. This was back when um, when Trump was ordered to turn himself in in Georgia, and yep. they had the, uh, the mug shot. Right? Mm -hmm. Remember that? Yep. Okay. And both... both news feeds were talking about that whole situation. Yeah. And interestingly enough, they had almost verbatim the exact same reel running underneath, the, the words running underneath. And one of them said, Biden using Trump, you know, this photo for, uh, to raise campaign funds. Uh -huh. And the other one said, Trump using photos. And so, yeah. That's a fun example. I thought that was I thought that was really interesting that they're both they're both pointing out how the other one's doing it. While I, the only thing I could assume is that they were actually both doing it. Okay, so that's the one thing. The other thing yeah. that comes to mind, and I think it relates, is what we were talking about before we started recording, where I had shared that I kind of came across this week in some of my reading the idea of umwelt. Yeah, you have to describe that. Yeah. I haven't heard that term before. Okay, so Umwelt is a term that scientists who study characteristics of animals, I forget the I forget what that I forget the name of that particular science, but they um, they realize that animals, all animals, including humans, experience the reality differently. Right? So, for example, a dol like a dolphin can hear things that a human or other, like, would never be able to hear. Same thing with, like, a dog, right? Like, you're sitting there, and all of a sudden your dog might jump up because it hears yeah. something that you don't hear. Yeah. All right. So it doesn't mean that reality is different for you and your dog. It just means that you guys are experiencing reality differently. So there is still this reality, uh -huh, yeah. Yeah. right? So same thing with, like, buzzards. I didn't really... I think I'm buzzards. not, by the way, I'm, I'm not conceding the point that there yeah. is an ultimate reality that everyone is experiencing. Sure. I'm just, I'm just uh, following along with you 
that that is part of this concept. So I'm with you. Okay. That. All right. Good. I'll take that. So then um, I didn't realize. Like I think it's it, I think it's a buzzer. Can see a mouse in a field almost three miles away. Sure. That that blew my mind. Yeah. Right. And so a buzzard is going to experience reality different than a dolphin. Yep. And both of them are going to experience reality differently than me. Yep. Right? So um, the, uh, so the definition that I found was simply that the world as it's seen, heard, and felt, the world as someone or something experiences it as unfelt. Yep. All right. So then... If you, took, if you look at humans and you go back to this concept of what you're talking about with uh, what, what, what are you exposing yourself to and what information are you getting, I would argue that the only way to understand the, the true reality of the situation is to be able to somehow objectively hear both sides, all like... And I don't know that I'm even capable of doing that as a human. Yeah, I don't. Right. I don't know how you would. Right. Keep going. So okay. So I, think, I still think there's something there. So keep. Okay. Yeah, so I'm another example then is how reality changes for people or, or animals over time, and that was the story of there was, and I'm, I, I think it's pronounced juvenile, but the Roman po poet juvenile. He had a. There was this poem. I'm not going to read the whole poem, but in there he uses this phrase: "A prodigy as rare upon the earth as a black swan." And the reason he uses that is because he, there is no such thing as a black swan for the Roman poet. All right. But then in 1726, a Dutch explorer, and again, I'm going to probably mutilate the name, Wilhelm de Vlaming, I think is how you pronounce Good it. Good try. All right. Thank you. And um, never make fun of somebody the way they pronounce it if you only, because it means that they read it. But what if right? it's fun to make fun of them? I'm good. I'm okay. You, I, you know what? Actually, I prefer being made fun of because it, I feel like that's, that, that shows a closeness. So anyway, um, but he, in 1726, he is exploring, the, he's exploring Western Australia. And guess what he finds? Black swans. Sure. Right? And so he, he takes two of them, a male and a female, and he brings them back to Europe. And what happens is anyone who sees these black swans... Because it's the same, right? Like, uh, a prodigy is rare upon the earth as a black swan. It is like what we might say today uh, when pigs fly or when hell freezes over. The idea is that it's not, it's not going to happen. Right. Right? But all of a sudden, in Europe, people start seeing these black swans and their umwelt changes. Sure. Right? Like, their whole understanding of reality changes. And so, I think... A lot of times what happens is we're arguing and we're getting upset. Because I've often wondered, like, why do we get so angry about certain things? And I, I think what it is is you're ch actually challenging my understanding of reality. And, and I have chosen, I think it's important to acknowledge this too, with a lot of the things that, that create my reality, I have chosen to believe that. Okay. I'm not. I'm, I'm not conceding, but continue. Okay. So I, in in the, um, and there could be a lot of contributing factors to why I would choose the way I've chosen. Okay. Right. And now you're getting into conversations about free will and things like that. Yeah. But I. Um, by the way, if you can hear the screaming in the background of this recording, it's the best. We're sitting right next to uh, a playground where. Uh, some wonderful kids are it's, just, it's the best. just screaming and yelling. It's hilarious. It is good. Um, now I lost my train of thought. Oh, so I choose to believe. And, and there can be, there, there's factors that contribute to why I might choose the way I choose. But going back to the gym, I'm watching the two that are doing the exact same thing, right? And my response to that is angry. But in reality, if I only watched one of them, I would have picked right up with it. Why, why, why were you? What made you angry about that? Angry might have been an overstatement, but it frustrated because it pointed out to me how we don't, and I don't know if we ever did, but again, I, I, that we don't have an objective news. Correct. Is that is that the this? Yeah, the and I'm not saying we ever have. 
Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm I don't not know. You won't concede that either. No, 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 no. no. I'm, I, I was actually <laughs> gonna say there is that I'm not gonna nitpick because um, I think that that's an annoying thing, and um, I actually think that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I think that I think that the frustration is is heartfelt, and and I understand it. And I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. Something I discovered right out of college, I think. Yep. So this is like 20 years ago. I think it was right out of college, but I remember realizing this. I remember realizing that anytime I see a news story about a celebrity in the legitimate news section, they've got something coming out. It doesn't matter what the news story is. Mm. They might've gotten a drunk driving ticket. They might've uh, broke, you know, they, they might've, um, I don't know, broken up with their, breaking up with their significant other is kind of, uh, it's kind of gossip rag stuff. But, um, but if there is some news story about Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks showed up on the, uh, on the um, Epstein flight log, right? Something yeah. like that. Sure. And it shows up in the, in the regular, in the legitimate kind of quote unquote legitimate news mm -hmm. um, section. Uh, of the news, they've got something coming out in like a week. Mm. That's what oh, I started seeing it over and over again, and it started making it made me so mad. Mm. So I was like, "We're being jerked around." That's what's happening. Yeah, we're being jerked around, and if it's it. It goes to your whole point about the about the mugshot. The both sides, both sides are jerking around their uh, their their constituents, right? Both sides are using the same thing. And and that's a really, that's a really stark example. But that kind of stuff happens every moment of every day, right? Um, I think when you're talking about um, people getting a different worldview based on you know the information that's being fed to them, and of course that sounds prejudicial, but I really think that that. That's the reality of experience is that you're you're just experiencing everything you're being fed, even if you went out and bought the book or whatever, it's still something being fed to you. Um, but what we're talking about here is like the, the social media platforms and, and news and YouTube and, and that kind of thing. The, all of the information being fed to you, it's crafting your worldview. You and I have talked about this before, that I do think that it's very beneficial to try to listen to and follow what an opposing view or an opposing uh, viewpoint of the world might listen to and might follow. Yeah. I think that's very important. Um, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you that I uh, heard somebody say one time, um, there's a talk show host who... Um, leaned, uh, they, they leaned right. Um, they're kind of libertarian. I, I listened to them. Um, I listened to them quite a bit and they would get every once in a while, they would say something that wasn't, uh, this was back in the Obama era. They would, they would say something that wasn't, um, disparaging enough of Obama mm -hmm. and they would get emails with people who were mad at him, mm -hmm. right? Cause they're, cause they're just, you know, they said something, oh, you know, I, yeah, I think he, this this makes sense or something whatever doesn't matter. They get they get uh, um, emails to remind them. And I remember him saying, "I don't know how you people learn anything unless you listen to people you don't agree with every once in a while." Right. Right. Yeah. I don't know how you would learn anything. So so I do think that that there's there's value in that when you're talking about trying to get opposing viewpoints. Mm -hmm. I think that makes a lot of sense. When it comes to trying to have relationships in real life with people. For me, the number one thing that I can do is just recognize that their worldview, that umwelt, mm -hmm. is different than mine. And for me, that's the first step of empathy mm -hmm. for that person that I'm angry with, right? Um, when, when someone says a, um, someone makes some statements that gets under my skin because I know they probably have been, they read this thing or they, they saw this, they heard this person talking that I have heard is not such a great person or whatever. Right. right. I can, I can hear a little code word, 
right? And so now it gets under my skin and now I'm, I've put them in that group. And I am assuming that they think something about me too. That's, that's happening mm. immediately. I'm assuming that they're calling me something, right? Well, I've identified with something at that point. I've identified with some group. I've identified with some ideology at that, at that point. But if I can remember that they saw the, the Trump mugshot uh, with a completely different, um, uh, I can't remember what the, the name of that scrolling um, banner is at the bottom. There's a name for that. I can't remember what yeah, that's called. But, no that. um, but they, they saw that screen with a completely different um, message behind it, or they saw completely different news that I've never seen. Their worldview has been shaped by that. That at least gives me some level of empathy mm -hmm. where, I can, where I can listen. I can listen to them. At least listen. And maybe, maybe not have an immediate opinion on it. Mm -hmm. Right? Maybe not have an immediate reaction, an immediate opinion. I don't know how you would or what it would even mean to have an objective viewpoint on something. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what that would even mean, how that could be. We could talk more about that, but um, that might be a little, uh, little more esoteric um, mm -hmm. than what we're trying to get at. But, but I do think that on a practical level, um, on a practical level, you know, I can just at least continue to remember that they have a different umwelt, they have a different worldview than I do, and that's going to shape assumptions differently. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a phrase called theory of mind that is relatable to that, okay. which is the idea of being able to conceptualize that somebody else has a different experience than you do. It's something that um, uh, infants obviously don't have. Toddlers have a real difficult time with this. This is a, um, this is a human development thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm. There's some indication that some uh, ape, um, ape species have some level of theory of mind, but very, very basic. Um, you can't teach without a theory of mind, mm -hmm. right? Um, you have to, you have to, that's, that's how, um, how parents are able to teach things to, uh, to their young that's not, um, that's not purely instinct, mm -hmm. right? Because you have to, you have to imagine. And the, the perfect example of this, my wife talks about, um, and, and I had a similar experience. She had an experience when she was, and I, I'm going to get the, um, the age wrong, but call it six, something like that, six, seven, something like that, mm -hmm. where she was in traffic and she looked over at, at a car right next to, right next to them and saw a person and all of a sudden it all crashed in on her that that person lived a completely, a complete life. They, that they had a complete life, yeah. that they would leave that moment and go on to their life and experience it in the same way that she was going on to her life and experiencing it. And that they had a past, they had, you know, that it had nothing to do with her and that was their experience only. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that that's a, you know, it's not something that is, um, is equally developed, I think, in everyone. And I think that it's a, 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 a place you can start for empathy. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, to get through difficult conversations with somebody that you want to maintain a relationship with, a friendship or a, or yeah. a spouse or whatever. So uh, when you're talking about the idea that, you know, um, the, uh, I'm, the you know, everyone has their own story, everyone's going to go on and live their own lives. It made me think about a um, book called uh, Universal Christ uh -huh. um, by Richard Rohr. And he talks, he Anyway, it's, we can talk more about that some other time, maybe. Um, the other thing, so again, again, as you're talking about this idea of how do you, the empathy part. Yep. 
And um, it made me think of a, a quote, Walt Whitman. Yeah. And he, I don't know how much of this quote is his. I do know that be curious, like be curious, not judgmental, is yeah. attributed to Walt Whitman. But I found this whole, this whole quote and I thought it was interesting. When something happens that you don't want to happen, when you don't get what you want, when somebody else does it better than you, be curious, not judgmental. When you hear no rather than yes, when it's just taking too long, when you're listening to a story with an obvious ending, be curious, not judgmental. When the same thing keeps happening to you again and again, when, something, when somebody is saying something, saying something, when you're having the same negative thoughts in your head, be curious, not judgmental. When you feel awful inside, when the world outside feels scary, when you just don't know what to do, be curious, not judgmental. When the path seems to come to an end, when the money runs out, when the words dry up, be curious, not judgmental. Um, There's a Ted Lasso scene that goes around uh, where he's social media darts. where he's playing darts mm -hmm. that I'm sure was pulled from that. I have not heard that um, yeah. that poem before, but mm -hmm. it's just way too close. Yeah. Uh, it's that. Yeah, it's where he's talking about, and if if you if he had been curious, not judgmental, he would have asked me. That's right. If you ever played darts, that's right. I would have said yes, sir. Well, and what's great about that speech is that he starts it off saying that people had underestimated him his whole life. Mm -hmm. And that it always bothered him. Right. And that it's it's part of his character development, right? That you're getting kind of a history that he hasn't always been this happy-go-lucky guy, but that he um, that when you are when you're worried about judgment, it's it's upsetting. Right. That's really upsetting, and that's a division as well. And here we are quoting Ted Lasso, but another yeah. thing that he does in that video which I thought was really good, was he talks about how when it bothered him being judged, yep. but then he realized that that's actually their problem. Yep. Because if they had been curious about him, and that's how he go, kind of then goes into that whole thing. That's right. And so I, to me, that circles back around in my mind to this idea that our desire to fight with somebody has more to do with us than it has to do with them. Sure. Right? And so even like when you're saying... When somebody says something or somebody does something, you're talking about how you're responding to that internally, how you're making meaning of that internally. Yeah. And they're saying, so I could be saying something completely with with one thought in mind. You're hearing it another way. And then also then you're jumping to the possibility that this is somehow a judgment upon you. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So, again, I think that it has a lot to do with our our view, our understanding of reality, and our um, our fear that what we have, the way that we're experiencing reality, or the, the things that we have determined are important in this reality, that if they're not, then somehow I'm losing control, and I, who knows how far I can spiral out of control. I'm losing control, uh, I might lose my place in the pack, Mm -hmm. Right in the herd. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that we dismiss social um, uh, social repercussions uh, too quickly. Sometimes uh, I think that they make a much bigger impact on on how we act. Um, you know, or or to your point, um, our our uh, expectation of what the social group ramifications might be, what the mm -hmm. social consequences might be. Um, yeah, but of course, okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, try to say this uh, coherently. Um, it's always seemed obvious to me that nobody gets upset about an insult hurled their way that, that they don't believe is true. Hmm. Um, now, you know, I'm sure I'm going to say that and then somebody's going to come in the comments and they're going to say, well, what if there's a, you know, they're, they're using some sort of naughty word or something, you know, you get whatever. I just mean, and here's, here's my example. I'm going to try to say this without sounding completely arrogant. Oh, just go I ahead. have, I have, I am very clear on my, um, 
on my weaknesses. If you make some sort of comment about my competency or my, um, uh, or my dependability, that's going to hurt. And depending on how it comes at me, I might get angry about that. Sure. I might get really irritated. Sure. You can call me stupid all day long. I, I literally won't even hear it. Hmm. Now, I say that, and that always sounds so terrible, but it's true. I just don't, I don't believe that I'm stupid. I right. just, I believe a certain level of my, I, I, I believe something about my level of intelligence. Mm -hmm. Okay. I also absolutely believe something about my level of dependability and competence, which is completely different than that. Mm -hmm. And so if you start talking about my respectability, you, like, you, like I'm not acting in a respectful way. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm not somebody you can count on. I'm not somebody you can depend on. That's gonna hurt. That's gonna be rough, and I might get angry depending on how it comes, because that is absolutely what I believe about myself. I really think that insults cannot have any kind of effect on you negatively, unless it, unless you believe it in some way. Um, I'm not saying that that means that you should just be going around throwing insults at people, obviously, like be nice, whatever. But I'm just saying, I think that it's a good indication for oneself about what they believe about themselves mm -hmm. based on what, um, uh, what can hurt them if you, you know, if you, if, if you throw that insult their way. All right. So now I'd be curious. Bring that back then to our current um, political climate. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You call somebody a bigot. If they're sure they're not, are they going to get angry about that? Hmm. I think that in a situation like that, I think that what they're what they're getting angry about, what that person might get angry about, is what they think you're also calling them. If you call someone a snowflake, are they gonna get angry about that if they don't believe it about themselves? Again, I think that they're getting angry about something else that they think you're calling them as well. Maybe I'm wrong about that. What about, what about, um, I, I have a certain way that I want to be viewed. Yeah. My avatar. Yeah. Right. Going back to that. Yeah. And even if I don't believe that about myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say you call me a bigot. Yeah. Okay. And I don't believe that about myself. Yeah. So my initial reaction wouldn't be to be upset. But because you've called me that in public, yeah. and I don't want to even be thought of being as a bigot, yeah. I'm going to react to it to defend myself so that social it doesn't damage my avatar. Yeah, the social ramifications. Yeah, it. and so I think that's another level when we think about politics. Yeah, that's, yeah. And so I think, it, I think it's nuanced, right? Because I'm, like, mm -hmm. if... Because I, we do see, in my opinion, first of all, attacks have gone from being about uh, policy and uh, different opinions about um, uh, policy. That's the best word I can come up with. Right. right? Okay. Whether it be foreign or domestic. Right. We used to be able to have conversations around that. But now it's become very personal. That's right. And, and what I often, this is something else I think about. So, so one is I'm only going to get offended if I believe that's actually pretty true about me. Yeah. The other thing, too, is what does it do to my reputation, to, yeah. my, to that, that avatar that I'm putting out there. Right. Right. And, uh, but I think that there's also this other thing to be considered is often the thing that, and it goes back to that first one is that I will point out to other people their shortcomings, their failures, when they are mine. Okay. And I'm more apt to point it out. Like, for example, one of the Rejection. things... Yeah, one of the things that... And this may not even be true. I don't know. 
But in, in the church, it seems that those leaders that are most often caught in some sort of infidelity yep. are themselves some of the biggest preachers against what they themselves are actually doing. Sure. And so when I look, when, when I hear one side or the other talking about, well, you don't care about our country. You don't, you wouldn't be, you're not strong enough to do this, or you're too weak to do that. I think, in my mind, there's some truth to the fact that they themselves are, are could be accused of the exact same thing, which is why I go back to the television when seeing Fox News and CNN running very similar, I don't know the term, we've already established that. Cairo. Is that what that's called, yep. that ticker at I the just, bottom? I just, it just came to me, it's the Cairo. Okay. That's right. So, except the only difference was one said it was Biden doing it, and one said it was Trump doing yeah. it. And they're both doing it. Yeah. And then, so at some point, they both realized it's probably not, it's not really the right thing to do. Yeah. But they're both doing it, and they're both just going to point it out. Mm-hmm. So gonna, it's like that, don't look at me. If I, the more, the, the, this also, I know, is probably really dated. Shade. The okay. more shade that I can throw your way, yeah. it doesn't put light on me. It just takes the attention off of me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean... Okay, so... I'm going to have to replace that, by the way. Replace what? That. <laughs> no, this is fine. Yeah. I'll just hold it in my lap. Okay, um, uh, okay so... I've, I've made the, the argument that you're not going to... You're not going to get upset about something unless um, unless you believe it yourself. Yep. Here's which, by the way, I completely agree with that. Here's what. Well, I, I just I've been thinking about it while you were talking because that's what I do when other people are talking. I try to think about what I'm going to say next. Sure. Um, there's no reason to listen to the other person except to come up with fodder for my next uh, yeah, conversation. Yeah, which goes topic. against the entire principle and preset behind this podcast. That's right. That's right. Um, I think what the clarification that I would make um, that I'm working out right now is that um, that's the only thing that's going to hurt. That it's not that that it's not going to hurt unless I believe it about myself. Okay. Right? You can't hurt my feelings. You can't hurt my feelings by calling me stupid. You just can't. You just can't. I I mean it just it just it just is what it is. You can hurt my feelings calling me incompetent or calling me. Not dependable or something mm-hmm. like that. Okay, so that's that's where I think I land on that. It's that it's not that it's not going to make me mad. It might make me mad. It's not going to hurt my feelings. But other things can make me mad. And I think that what you're talking about is the um, you know when you're you're challenging an avatar. I think that can make you mad. Mm-hmm. Probably out of some sort of fear, um, uh, fear of exposure, fear of of losing social standing. Um, Fear of something, right? Um, you know, I, I also, I also think that you know, you you call somebody a bigot in our current zeitgeist, and it's it's a bit of a nuclear option, right? Um, at this at this stage in our society, it's one of the worst things that you can call somebody mm-hmm. um, in terms of. In terms of reputational destruction, right? I'm not saying that it's the worst. Um, it, I'm not saying, you know, I'm using the term here now, but um, you know, I'm not saying it's the same thing as calling somebody a slur, right? Mm-hmm. I'm saying in terms of reputational destruction, there's not many things that you could call somebody and and get them labeled that would be worse than bigot, right? Um, and so, I think that 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 probably relates to your um, to your avatar point, that you don't want to be labeled that. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be labeled with the thing that is uh, the worst thing or something that's going to cause them reputational harm. Um, Let's use the other side, you know, um, somebody, uh, you know, calling a, um, somebody who is an advocate for some uh, liberal policy, a snowflake. Now, again, that's pretty dated, too. Nobody really uses that term anymore. That's kind of that's five or six years ago. But still, let's, let's, it, 
that would anger people, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think it's a similar thing in that, um, you know, nobody wants to be considered weak, mm. right? Nobody wants to, nobody wants to be considered, uh, um, like they don't have intestinal fortitude, mm -hmm. right? Everyone, you, no matter who they are, no matter what they're, uh, it's, it's similar to everyone, um, cares about their children, right? No matter what ideology you have, virtually everyone cares, cares about their children, except for the, you know, the exceptions that just exist on, on any kind of, um, large enough scale, but they're the exceptions that has nothing to do with ideology. Um, and so, yeah, so I think I'm coming around to this idea that, um, that the anger probably comes from some sort of threat to your avatar. It's a threat to your reputational, um, to, to your reputation within the group. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I would go back to, it'd probably be a good idea to be careful, uh, when you're dealing with people you care about. So you can decide who you care about mm -hmm. to try to not threaten their reputation, their, their reputational status, their, their, you know, their status mm -hmm. in the group. Mm -hmm. In this group, like if we're talking about our Sunday school, right? In the Sunday school group, let's not do that. But in the larger society as well, you know, to to your point um, uh, last week when you were talking about how you want to kind of take what we're trying to do in here and give it out there, mm -hmm. maybe one of the um, the ideas from that is to be careful about uh, you know. A, about ways that you would be threatening um, the 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 you know their repu threatening their avatar. Mm -hmm. Now I can already hear the voices saying, uh, "Well, Lucas, how are you going to fight for justice if you don't threaten people's position? What you're just mm -hmm. gonna you're just gonna, you're going to care more about their reputation than about the people that they're hurting, right? Mm -hmm. That's the that's." That's the obvious answer that comes right after. And I would say, depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to create a place where people can be curious, then we're going to have to be curious first, I think. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, obviously I have, I have opinions about things, and, and um, some of them are strong and some of them aren't. And I'm not trying to say people shouldn't have strong opinions about things. I think there's a difference between making a statement about something you think should be or shouldn't be and making a mocking statement that signals to your group the people that it's okay to mock. Yeah, no, I, I what, yeah, I'm thinking about it. It's not always what you say, but it's how you say it. Yeah. Right, and so like, like you can, you can challenge someone's behavior mm -hmm. without attacking their character. Yep, and that's that is a great point. And man, that's hard. I think that's hard. And I think the problem that we're having in politics today is that we immediately attack character. Uh huh. Right, and so behaviors and policies, it's they're almost secondary. So even like. Even when we're talking about what should the what should America's involvement um, or stance or response to the escalating violence currently taking place in uh, Gaza? Yep. Right. This is a this this is a good example because you see the stark examples. Of, of what you're about to talk about online every day, yep. constantly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in fact, it's hard to have a conversation, and that maybe is another topic, but how well, often we'll have extremely strong opinions that are uh, uninformed. Yep, okay. sure. Mm -hmm. And so, anyway, but, but as you're listening to politicians, 
<laughs> well, I don't know why that was a difficult word <laughs> for me. <laughs> sorry, that's all right. But as you, it through. Yeah. As you're listening to politicians talk about what they believe should be the appropriate response, uh -huh. participation, stance, it's never just here's the facts, right? So, like, instead of just saying, well, you know, traditionally the United States has been in a position of that, 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 whatever. Right. right. What it is is, well, if I were the president right now, because our current president has no backbone, sure. Or you know, and it becomes immediately using situations to to personally attack the character of another person, instead of entering into a debate with another person from a position of respect, mutual respect, where we can disagree about what our response should be. But let's be informed about it. Let's be uh, let's be curious, and together try to come up with what we feel might be the best response. But we use everything as an opportunity to chop down, to destroy the the people that we think somehow oppose us or are standing in our way of of claiming power and authority. Yeah, per great, great example and. Um, what I would say to that is, uh, let's. I don't have. I almost said I don't have any problem with politicians to do that. I don't have any expectation that politicians would not do that. Of course they do that. That's their job. Ugh. It's motivating. So it's not motivating to the masses. And remember what their job is. Remember what a politician's number one job is. Always get elected and get reelected. If you forget that that's their job, we've lost the plot, and they've they've uh, they've succeeded in doing what they're trying to do, which is to get you to forget that that's their job. That's their number one job. Every year, always get elected, stay elected. Always. There's never, ever, ever anything that takes that top spot. That doesn't mean that they're not trying to do other things. Also like get rich and become corrupt. Um, but uh, that was a joke. Um, no, I, I hear you. Uh, I'm also sitting this, here thinking right now, I think another thing we have in common is we both have a little bit of cynicism in us. Um, I'd agree with all of that except with a little bit. Um, <laughs> so, yes, I, I am, I'm very cynical about um, politicians. I guess it's cynical. I guess it's cynical. Um, I don't... Um, I don't consider it cynical. I just consider it looking at reality. Now, that's what a cynic would say. It's fine. You can call me a cynic. That's fine. I don't. I don't have any problem with it. Um, I was looking for common ground. Yeah, that is common ground, actually. Uh, no, but here. So here's the thing. I do think that is what politicians are trying to do at all times in our in our particular uh, uh, governmental setup. Sure. If we had a monarchy with an aristocracy, mm. that would not necessarily be the case. They right. would have different motivations, the government officials, right? They would have different motivations. You might still say that they had the same motivations. They were just appealing to different, they would be appealing to different people and not to, to the masses. But in our particular setup, they do still have to try to appeal to the masses. Aside from whether or not they're bought and paid for by corporations or whatever, there's still a veneer that they need to, to maintain. So all of that just to say, I don't expect anything different from a politician because that's the most motivating thing to do. It's not motivating to debate on policy. What's motivating is to get individuals to identify with some some avatar and then tell them that that avatar is that that avatar is under threat from the other avatar that's the most motivating you know it reminds me of how this is how i've conceptualized it in the past during elections and when i'm the, you know, I'm talking about 20th century here. During elections, presidential elections and any kind of elections, you would have the candidate that wanted to do something and then you'd have the marketing team, 
The marketing team is going to help them get elected. Now, maybe not call the marketing team, maybe they're called political consultant, whatever, but they're the marketing team. And I will say what I saw with, and I'll just say, the genius of Trump mm -hmm. when it comes to um, campaigning is that by and large, he threw the policy out and went 100% marketing campaign. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is where we will be forever. Ugh. Now, I, I think so. I think so. All of that to say this, I don't, as far as our conversation, I don't care what the politicians are doing. I think they're a great example of what we don't have to do. Mm. But I think what happens and what's so destructive, destructive is the, the politician is doing that because that's the path of least resistance. Calling, calling somebody uh, that disagrees with, the, with your policy a bigot is that's a way easier way of winning the argument on the policy you want to get passed mm -hmm. than saying they don't really kind of understand this aspect of the policy on you know, page 34C. <laughs> right? Sure. It's way easier to call them a bigot. Right. So that makes sense why they would do that. But we don't have to. We don't have to take on that same um, modus operandi. Right. Right? We can be, we can stay curious yeah. with each other. We can maintain the, uh, the understanding that everyone is seeing a different worldview than we are mm -hmm. and literally seeing an entirely different news feed than we are. Yeah. That's presenting them with different correct facts that are painting a different opposite picture, maybe, than what they're saying, what I'm saying, right. what they're saying, whatever. You know, and and um, and stay and try to stay curious, and then you know do what we're trying to do, which is share life. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what that's what maintains bonds. But when it comes to politics, I mean, you know, like I said, I don't have, I I just don't have any. I, I, it doesn't surprise me at all that that is the tactic of a politician. It's probably what I would do if I was. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking if you're talking, at some point, elections have become like uh, electing homecoming king and queen. It, it, it's a popularity thing, and, and who, who can become the most popular? You know, one of the first people marketing. One of the first people to uh, to say that about American elections mm -hmm. was Alexis de Tocqueville in mm -hmm. uh, the mid nineteenth century when he did his uh, tour of America and really? like democracy in America. It's the most amazing thing you can read it in there. He said, um, he said, he, among other things, he said uh, one of the because what he's trying to do is he's trying to um, bring back a report to France. You know, France has their rev revolution yeah. in the at the end of the, the 1700s and it goes really great and then um uh but they're trying to work it out and, and of course it's, it's after 1848 and um they're so it's mid it's it's mid 19th century he's trying to tour the united states this beacon the only the only republic that has been established in in the modern world and then and then lasted for a while so how are they doing it what are the aspects of it and all of this and he comes back and he says among other things he says well something that we can be sure of when it comes to uh democratic um uh, practices any kind of government that's 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 uh, elected by the people is that um it is absolutely not a meritocracy you might you might get the best that rise to the top, you might, but that would be an accident. Mm -hmm. The thing that it selects for is popularity. That's the thing, and celebrity. I think he uses, in particular, he uses the word celebrity. Yeah. In the mid 19th century, when he's talking prophetic. about American elections. Prophetic. And another thing that I think is prophetic. I think the name of the movie was Idiocracy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. So I think I think one last one last thought about all of this. The other thing that we're talking about when we talk about curiosity, is critical thinking. Mm -hmm. At some point, we're going to have to, for a community, for individuals, to be able to um, 
not sort of fall into the trap that we see in American politics, you're going to have to engage in some critical thinking. Because right now, we hear it, we believe it, and it, and it, that's really damaging and that's really dangerous. Because not only that, we're also making it then the absolute truth and the the only way to understand reality. And then if you disagree with me, you're my enemy. And I've seen over the last, let's just say 12 years, yeah. families torn apart be, over presidential elections. Yep. And it's, uh, yeah, I agree. It's, it, it was a ubiquitous uh, topic going home for Thanksgiving long before mm. 2016, long before 2008, right? Yeah. That was a ubiquitous topic. Everyone knew it's painful to go home, right? Um, Krista and I watch a, um, a movie. We have a tradition every Thanksgiving. We watch Home for the Holidays okay. with uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Charles Durning, who is just a national, <laughs> national treasure. He's, I mean, everyone in that cast is fantastic, but... Um, you know, the movie is about going home mm -hmm. um, for Thanksgiving. And of course, the theme is it's painful to go home. Everyone sees you as as the kid still. Yeah. Everyone has their own idea of who you are. Yep. You're trying to tell them that I'm not that anymore. Dang it. You right. know, I'm a grown up now. Uh -huh. But the the other theme that was that was pulled through that movie and the reason that I love it so much um, is is that at the end of it we're gonna come back next year I'm still gonna come back next year I'm I'm not gonna just be like well you're not my mom anymore mm -hmm. right I'm not gonna be like well I absolutely am not going to come to Thanksgiving because you voted differently right um, yeah, I'm, this is my family. Right. And it's going to be painful, and that's part of what it is. And it's also, you know, it's also beautiful in a way, and it's also really impactful in a way, and it's funny, and it, you know, and this is what, this was kind of the ubiquitous idea of going home for the holidays. And I do think, you know, I read that, I read that tweet last week. Um, I do think the zeitgeist is more along the lines today of, no, it's a moral good to give up your relationship with the people who are close to you mm -hmm. if they have the wrong idea. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think that's um, destructive. Yeah. So next week is Thanksgiving. Yeah, that's right. So this is that's a good that's a good way. So we'll be eating turkey while we're recording this. Right? <laughs> we have to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, let me just wrap it up with this one last thought. And I think it was Rob Bell. You familiar with Rob Bell? I I think so. He, okay. Is he a late night talk show guy? No, Rob Bell is a former evangelical pastor. Oh, I know. The evangelical okay. Church rejected. Okay. Because he wrote this very offensive book. Called Love Wins. Okay. Yeah. And it, it again, that was a joke. I got it. Right? I got okay. it. All right. So yeah. um, he, he was talking, this was several years ago, and it was around the same time of year. He was talking about you're getting ready to go home for Thanksgiving. Uh -huh. And his thing was about religious differences. Yeah. We're talking about political differences today. But he said, um, you know, it gets difficult. You go home, you're all sitting around the table, and all of a sudden, one of your relatives, your you know, uncle who's been drinking too much all day long, starts going in about the evil Muslims. Sure. And he goes, just look at him and say, that's, that's a really interesting perspective. What do your Muslim friends think? Yeah. And sure. I think that goes back to the idea of, I mean, you, if you say that, you probably, it's not going to land well. Probably not. Right. But it's to the point of be open to other perspectives. Mm -hmm. Actually be curious to learn. And um, don't, just believe everything that you hear just because it's being said by a particular person or a particular people group. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Unless I say it 
then you say it. Well, if you hear it on this podcast, then, then you can just believe it yeah. wholeheartedly. Don't even, don't Google anything. No need to pull no. up the computer. And especially if we give a quote, just trust that that quote's accurate. Absolutely. In mm-hmm. fact, if we probably said it first. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah.